to episode 11 of the Bunty UK podcast. Al fresco style. Indeed. We're outdoors. It's rather dark. So if you hear the sound of babies crying, or dogs barking, or horses mooing, <laughs> then that explains it. So who are we? I'm Simon. I'm Alan. I'm Davey. And I'm Tony. What's coming up in the show today? We've got a couple of interviews from Lug Radio Live. Uh, who are they with? We've got Pete Steen, who's talking about his uh, new ultra-portable laptop, the B2. Cool. And a great um, chat with the guys from OpenStreetMap about um, some fantastic things that are going on with um, free and open source mapping. Excellent. Yeah, we, we could have talked to them all day, really. It was pretty cool. And we've also got some news. Competition result from last time. We're going to review another uh, little PC, the Viglan MPC. And give it away. So is that a new competition we're having this episode? It is. Sounds like a fun-packed show. <laughs> it didn't sound boring enough. Oh, it did. Let's get on with it. Right, I have got my uh, Barry White voice on this time because uh, I've got a raging cold. But um, I mentioned in the last podcast that somebody come forward from the community with a bit of hardware that they uh, wanted to review for us, which is uh, great. And we've actually managed to get hold of him here. So, welcome, Pete. Hello. And what was it you got? What? Uh, tell us about the kit you bought. I bought. Um, one of these new netbooks, it's actually a rebadged MSI Wind, which I bought from, wait for it, PC World. It's, it's alright, we forgive you. It's an Advent 4211. Um, the one benefit it has over an MSI Wind, I think, is it was £260. That's all in, uh, you just walked into the shop and bought it? Yeah, yeah. well, I, I, I didn't want the £180 support contract they wanted to give me at the same time, but... But there you go, yeah, 260 and I think the MSI Wind, which isn't actually available yet, is going to retail for about 330 340 And it is an MSI Wind because I updated the BIOS to the 1.05 MSI BIOS and it didn't explode. So I think I'm pretty certain it's the real deal. Now, I'm right in saying this device is one of the ultra-portable laptops similar to the Asus E and other ones. Is that correct? Yeah, it is. It's, um, it's slightly bigger than the PC. However, it's actually slightly lighter than a 900. Um, we did an empirical test a little bit earlier where about three people held both of them at the same time. <laughs> that does sound somewhat scientific. I think, it's about, I think it's about 850 grams, something like that. It's slightly bigger than an E, though, because it has a 10-inch screen. It also has full-size keys uh, rather than the two-thirds size keys that the PC has. What kind of spec is it? You say it's you know it's similar to an EPC. What what is what kind of yeah? Give us the give us the nitty gritty. Yeah, it's got a 1.6 gigahertz um, Atom processor, um, the new Intel model. It's got a gigabyte of DDR2 memory. It's got a 1.3 megapixel webcam in the bezel. Um, as I say, full size keys, 10 inch screen, 1024 by 600. So it's the same res as the the E900. Yeah, but because it's a 10-inch, it actually makes it much easier to use a standard desktop on it. Um, it doesn't really need the kind of the sort of netbook kind of interface that you see on those things initially. So, I mean, something I found on the 701 is that a lot of applications didn't quite fit on the screen and you couldn't use all the features. One particularly bad one was Thunderbird. I'm guessing you don't suffer with the same problem on your model? No, nope, there's only one that gives me any problems, and that's the GIMP, because of its um, tall vertical... Uh, menu bars. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of a way around that at the moment. I mean, there is a, um, a Photoshop-styled um, GIMP that puts everything inside a window. It's GIMP shop or something, isn't it? Yeah, I'm going to try, try that out, but that's the only one that gives me any problems. I mean, if you maximise any other application, it just blows up to the size of the screen. It's, it's perfectly fine. What, um, what drive does it have on it? Obviously, the E's got a um, solid-state disk. Has it got a normal um, drive on it? It's got um, an 80 gig, two and a half inch um, laptop drive. Um, it's probably also worth pointing out it's got um, an SDHC slot as well, so you can you can add eight, 16 gig to the uh, to the memory. And the usual microphone, headphone type sockets. Um, yep, yeah, microphone, headphone sockets. It's got a built-in microphone, which I have to say is absolutely terrible, as are the speakers. But I don't think that's a, a unique aspect of this machine. I've, I've seen 1,500 quid machines that are no better, quite frankly. But the um, plug, plugged in with a, a USB microphone and a, and a pair of headphones, you get a really nice sound out of it. It's, it's really good. Now, uh, what was the actual uh, operating system that it was supplied with? Um, started off with XP. In fact, I think, whether it's rebadged or not, I think the wind's going to come with XP. I don't think 
I've not seen any models advertised that have um, Linux on them. I guess that's because it's got quite a large hard disk and they don't feel it's constrained by having a, a sort of quite a, 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 an operating system with quite a heavy footprint, you know. And the CPU is not a slouch. I mean, 1.6 gig, it's the Atom, the teeny tiny thing, isn't it? But it's still, it's pretty, yeah, pretty fast. I was using it earlier. It seems pretty okay. It uses all the compass transitions and everything with absolutely no problems at all. It's really, really zippy. It's an um, Intel video card, is it? Um, yeah, it's a GMA 950, I think. Uh, yeah, I seem to remember you uh, being quite a big fan of Compiz, and uh, and you, you, it's working on there seamlessly. There's there's no problems. Yeah, I love it. I love Blink. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, one thing I wanted to ask. Um, now, obviously, uh, it came with XP, and it doesn't actually have uh, a CD-ROM drive, does it? So, how did you actually go about installing Ubuntu on there? This is presuming he has installed Ubuntu. <laughs> Otherwise, why would he be sat here? Go on, tell us you put Ubuntu on it. <laughs> of course, I did. Um, Really simple process actually. The BIOS is quite nice in this machine um, and it supports booting from anything you can possibly imagine including over a network. And I created a bootable um, USB disk, uh, dropped a standard um, Hardy Heron ISO on it, booted from it and it immediately went to the um, installation screen. Is, did you find, was there an online how-to or something or is, is this like documented somewhere? Um, I mean, creating a, a bootable USB disk, no problem at all. Just Google it, and you'll find any number of solutions. Some simple, some complicated. I chose one of the simple ones because I'm not fantastic with the command line, but uh, that, was, that was no problem at all. It took about five minutes to do. Once, once I'd gone through that process, about five minutes, um, and, it was, and it, was, it was on there and ready to go. Have any um, issues with any of the hardware on it? And it, uh, for example, uh, the wireless. Have Ubuntu um, sort that out okay, or have you had any issues at all with any of the hardware on the system? Actually, I've only had problems with one piece of hardware, and that is the wireless card. Surprise, surprise. It's using a new um, Realtek 8187SE card, not currently supported in the, the latest kernel that ships with Hardy Heron, which is quite a, quite a new kernel, 2.6.2. 2.19 or something. something we don't do version numbers on this podcast <laughs> fine but it's, it's I mean it's a fairly new kernel that ships with uh, with Hardy and uh, it doesn't support it so I did have to compile um, that driver and insert it into the kernel again though that wasn't difficult there's already a, quite an active um, user community for the MSI wind and it's at msiwind.net and probably, I, I think, the most active forum within the msiwin.net site is the Linux forum. And there are lots of how-tos and lots of scripts. So I grabbed the script that was available on there that nobody's reported having any problems with. Five minutes later in a reboot, I'd got working wireless. There is one issue that I've discovered, however. Because this is quite a new piece of hardware, I, I think quite possibly the driver's quite immature. It doesn't like Network Manager with WEP. Colour me unsurprised. <laughs> Dave doesn't like Network Manager either. <laughs> it works, works perfectly well with WPA2, which I use at home. Works perfectly well with unsecured networks. But in my um, workplace, we use WPA. We have, we have an open WPA network, sorry, an open WEP network for visitors and it just won't associate. It's, it'll see it. Uh, you'll get one green light, but it just won't associate with it. So what I've done, I'm actually using YCD um, instead. And I know that's not a particularly pleasant piece of software, but it isn't actually causing me any issues. I think what I will do, as they start to improve the um, support for that particular driver, I'll probably go back to Network Manager at a later point just to see how it's faring. Uh, but right now I'm using YCD. Not an ideal solution, but I do want to be able to connect to web networks, and that's, that's the only way that seems to work right now. One thing you might want to do, I know that on Launchpad there's a, um, a personal package archive that's got Network Manager version 0.7 in it. You might want to take a look at that at some point if, if you, know, you want to try and see if that makes it any better. I might give that a go. When you say you use it when you're out and about, what's the um, battery life on that like? Um, I'm getting about... It, it's interesting, actually. I'm getting about two hours out of it, but it does have um, 
functionality on it. There's, there are a couple of things for fiddling about the screen brightness and all those other features. There's actually a two key combination that will drop the processor speed to 50% and will drop the brightness to 50%. When you do that, it doesn't exactly double the battery life, but I've, I've tried that and I've actually got about three and a half hours out of it. Although, you know, bright, if you're outside bright sunlight conditions, you can't really see the screen at that level of brightness. But I think two hours running everything at full pelt and dropping it down with the, with the function key combination to about to 50% on the processor and the brightness. Yeah, about three and a half hours. It's not bad at all. Have you uh, actually tried switching off the bling to see if you get any extra time out of it? <laughs> oh, I'm sure I would, but that's too much of a sacrifice for me, I'm afraid. <laughs> What about the um, the keyboard? You said it's a fair size, you know, decent size keyboard. Would you say it, you could sit at it for a fair amount of time and use it? Yeah, you know, for that three and a half hours, would you, you know, constantly work at it and use it as a normal laptop? Yeah, the the keys are full size um, and they're spaced about the same way as they're spaced on any other laptop. Um, so it's very very comfortable to use. There's quite a, quite a nice action on the keys. There's one weird thing about the keyboard, because it is very squashed, because they've got to fit everything into quite a small space, the bottom left key isn't control, it's the function key. The control key is one in, so I'm constantly finding myself trying to select a series of files, hitting func the function key instead of control. I'm getting used to it, but I think that's, that's really the only, um, the only downside to the size of the, the keys, I think. ThinkPad has the same problem. They, they put the function key in the inverted commas wrong place as well. How have you found it for video playback? Is it jumpy does it, or does it work reasonably well? It is absolutely gorgeous, <laughs> I have to say. I don't generally run Totem on it. I actually prefer Caffeine for various reasons, not least because it's got DVB TV support. Uh, but I run Caffeine. I was sitting on the tube yesterday watching Doctor Who Series 4, Episode 13, and it was absolutely amazing. And you imagine there's a lot of stuff going on on screen there. Um, it was a, probably a 350 megabyte AVI file. No breakup, no slowdown, absolutely fantastic. And as I say, I mean, audio with headphones plugged in is wonderful as well. It's a really nice experience watching a video on it. What, uh, so I think we've covered pretty much all that. Is there anything else it's got that, that we need to know about? Um, it does actually have, in addition to having um, built-in wireless, it does have built-in Bluetooth as well, which just switches on when you press the button. It's amazing. I'm absolutely stunned by the way everything's supported straight from an install of Hardy. The one, the one really interesting thing that I found, I installed Cheese. It's that new um, webcam program that allows you to manipulate, turn yourself into the Incredible Hulk on, on the camera, or break up the image, all that kind, all that kind of interesting stuff. If you actually start the application, it starts the webcam up immediately. It's amazing. Of course, it shouldn't be like that. It should, everything, you know, every system you buy from the shop should be pre-installed with Ubuntu and everything should just work out the box. But it is a nice, pleasant experience when you get one that, yeah, you install in it and it works really well. Don't you think? Yeah, I don't disagree with you. In fact, I mean, I think the MSI Wind and all the other uh, netbooks, to my mind, are perfect candidates for running Ubuntu. And I'm surprised they don't offer that option. But I've I've looked into it, actually, and it doesn't appear that the MSI Win's going to be offering a Linux solution, uh, probably because of its 80 gigabyte disk, I, I would imagine, but um, they all look to be shipping with XP. My experience of installing um, a Linux distribution, absolutely painless. I mean, I can't speak for any other, other distro, but I'm a bit of an Ubuntu freak, so works for me. <laughs> The fine people at Viglin gave us a unit to review. Uh, what was it called? It was the MPC? MPC-L. Ah. And I guess the L means Linux, I don't know. And uh, most of us have had a bit of a play of it, some of us more than most. And, uh, yeah, I mean, Simon, you, you had quite a play of it, didn't you? What, what do you think of it? Yeah, I had it for a couple of weeks. Uh, it's a nice little box, actually. Tiny little thing, tiny little unit. Um, it's probably about the same sort of dimensions as an A5 piece of paper. Quite small. Yeah, it's about half a video cassette or yeah, something like that. Yeah, something like that. Lightweight. And really, that's the, that's the big thing. Maybe that's what the L stands for. Uh, it is lightweight. It's a tiny little thing. Not incredibly powerful. And so you really got to think about what do you want to use this thing for. I think one of the things that really interested us about this unit is it actually comes shipped with Ubuntu. But it wasn't a current one, was it? It was a fairly old one. 
Yeah, I had that first. Uh, yeah, I had it out of the box, and it was uh, it was running um, the XFCE Zubuntu, but I think it was running Feisty. It seems so long ago now that I started playing with it. I think it was Feisty, which is seven oh four. Yeah, so it's quite old already. Mm. So it's still supported. I mean, it's not the latest current you know version, and you know it's it arrived in a tatty box. So it could well have been a review unit that's done the rounds. You know, mm. so I, and I guess Zubuntu probably changes at a slower pace than the other. Mainstream Ubuntu? No, not really. It's um, it keeps up, you know, same release schedule as the other versions. Yeah, but uh, I don't know. I wonder whether there's BSC change in between Feisty and Hardy that you would actually see. But well, one one big change I noticed. I did actually upgrade it mm. from uh, Feisty to Gutsy, and then from Gutsy to Hardy, and I broke it. So um, color me unsurprised. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was just a software breakage, which I filed a bug, and it has been fixed. So if anyone else has one of these and they upgrade it to Hardy. It should be okay because the fix has gone through. It was a oh. video driver problem. So when I took it out of the box um, and installed and plugged it into a display, uh, it, it all just kind of worked. Um, but I was um, kind of disturbed by a couple of things. No, disturbed's the wrong word. Surprised. Surprised by a couple of things. Like, for example, the um, there's no flash installed, which compared with the efficient PC we looked at last time, yeah, that's that's useful. But actually, when you come to do some browsing, you realize why Flash is uh, disabled, because the CPU can't really cope with it. If you go to YouTube, the frame rate is really low, and the other reference site we use, the BBC iPlayer, it's just unusable. So you know, for Flash-type stuff, no, it's probably not ideal. Um, and the other thing was automatic updates were turned off. So um, I don't know if that was deliberate. Uh, that they'd done or again all of this could be lumped together as the fact that it's a review unit and it's probably done the rounds around some journalists so i'd forgive all of that because any geek worth their salt is going to reinstall anyway there were some um, resolution issues like screen resolution issues you only got what did you get out of it well to be fair i didn't play with it that much but the only ones that were enabled from when i got it uh was 640 by 480 and 800 by 600 that could have been down to the broken video driver that i the bug that i've reported i don't know if that's the version that's on there is fixed or not, I don't know. So yeah, I probably broke that as well. <laughs> it probably needs a good, clean reinstall. Whoever gets this uh, PC after we finish with it yeah, <laughs> probably wants to reinstall it. Well, I, I think we'll probably supply it a uh, refresh install, I think. Oh, well done, mate. Well volunteered. Well, yeah. I'll tell you what, I'll put an Ubuntu CD in there as well. <laughs> oh, we could also have a podcast sticker stuck on the side. And the CD will be completely useless because there's no <laughs> CD on <wrong> the <laughs> Sticker would be very useful. <laughs> okay, so what's inside this box? What hardware has it got? Not much. <laughs> it's um, It's got a video out, six USB ports. I think two are 1.1, which you must connect the um, keyboard and mouse to, and then you've got four on the front, which are USB 2. It's got an AMD geode CPU, which is basically everything on one chip. Right. So if you look at the the board, we've had it apart, and you look at the board, and it's just like one chip in the middle of the board, and that's that's pretty much it. So it's got network, one Ethernet port, yeah, and and on the front it had um, four uh, USB ports, yep, uh, two LEDs for HD uh, activity and power, and it also had the on and off button. Now the interesting thing I found about the on and off button is when you actually switch the unit off. It doesn't cleanly shut down. It just powers directly off. I think that's because uh, I set in uh, the boot configuration to switch off ACPI because it wouldn't boot with ACPI on. So it's probably just the detection of ACPI that's broken. So who broke it? Well, me again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the other um, thing it's got on it, actually, just to finish off the hardware bit on the front, is um, a speaker. Uh, now, it's a tiny little speaker, but yes. actually it, it really works quite well. And, and it's got and a headphone and microphone port on the front as well. So what storage has it got in it? You mentioned disk. Well, it's got a two and a half inch um, hard drive in there, so I think it comes with forty gig. Uh, I can't remember, but it's yeah, it's got a it's got it's a proper, a proper hard drive, in proper it. laptop type hard drive. Yeah. yeah, so you can make it as big as you want. So did you actually open the box up? Did you yeah. the actual case up? Yeah, was it quite cramped in there? There's um, mm, you could get more in there, but it was it was nice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not much more. <laughs> it's got. It's um, the RAM is on the on the underside as well, yeah. isn't it? It's um, laptop sized. You could probably do thing. something like um, squeeze a Bluetooth unit into there. Actually, just thinking about expanding it. Yeah, you probably could actually. You could probably put flash memory inside it. You know, like all these people do with the Asus uh, EEE PCs. Yeah. And they squeeze loads of stuff inside. There's actually a, a fair amount of room. You could squeeze some mm. cool stuff in, and it hasn't got any fans, so it doesn't make any noise. What spec is the processor? How fast is it? Uh, three, four hundred megahertz, something like that. Oh, so it's really quite slow. It's quite a low end. I mean, it's the geode. If correct me if I'm wrong, I think there's similar kind of CPU that's in the OLPC. 
Right. I, I think it's worth mentioning that I think the original target device for this was to actually be a thin client. Uh, so you're not actually supposed to use it to actually doing processing locally. It's meant to be where it actually happens on a big server somewhere, and it's actually just displayed locally. I, I think that's one of the things to remember. Uh, so I think it's a bit forgive. You think you can forgive it a bit, being rather slow. Yeah, but, I mean, they, when we got an email from them and they we told them we were going to review it, they said, you know, we know it's slow. It's it's not designed to be run like that. It's designed to be like a thin client. But it does work. Yeah, I, yeah. If I, for basic browsing, it. it, it it depends what you're after. If you're after speed of light, yeah, this isn't going to work. But if you're after something that you want to leave in the kitchen with a small monitor on or something like that, and just sort of some ad hoc browsing... It'd be all right for running your IRC, wouldn't it? Yeah. Which you, I mean, <laughs> you could leave it on, because it's, it's very low power. It's only uh, 8 to 10 watts. All right. And that compares with uh, the average laptop at about 20 watts. Well, I think you have to remember, if you couple that with a monitor as well, then it's easily going to bring up the whole unit. Yeah, I kind of meant about true, leaving leaving it on permanently. Not not um, not that the total usage while you're using it is eight watts. But I meant if you leave it on permanently and don't worry about the time it takes to boot it up and shut it down. If it's left on, you're only consuming eight to ten watts. Mm. Um, so it's a valid point. You know, not having a monitor on all the time and using it as a normal PC. I put IP cup on it because ah. I think that's probably where it could be quite successful as a geeky toy yeah yeah but the thing is it's only got one uh ethernet port hasn't it yeah but you can get usb to ethernet um adapters nowadays and it's got four ports on the front so it would make a nice ip cup box i put ip cup on it was just trivial it went on and it was easy and it's done so i think i might actually just um blag on myself and um and use it at home so could you use it for you know attaching a load of storage to the network a bit like a, a slug Okay, uh, who makes the slug? Yeah, the Linksys Linksys slug thing, which is a very low power little PC essentially that you bung a load of USB discs on. Yeah, you probably could. I've I've got I've got a slug myself, um, and it would probably be easier. The slug's a bit of a it's a bit of a clutch to get going, but once it's done, it it works. Whereas the that's um, the benefit. The 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 Viglin just works. Hard drive. Yeah, yeah. Hard drive. You can do a full install on it. Yeah, so that's uh, definitely one option. Uh, Probably better than a Drobo. I don't know. One of the, <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> one of the problems with the uh, the uh, USB Ethernet thing, though, is the one that I tried um, gave a maximum throughput of six megabits a second, which yeah, you know be- might be okay if someone's on a- on ADSL, but my broadband provider is twenty meg, so that would become a bottleneck for me if I put that as my IP cop box. Yeah, sure. But that might be a, a limitation. I don't know if that's a limitation of the the USB Ethernet thing or whether it's CPU bound. The CPU was very high when I did that test. Mm. What about actually installing stuff on it? Obviously, it hasn't got a CD drive. So how do you go about installing a distribution like IPCOP or something like that on it? I guess there's a few ways. You can do it off of a USB stick or off of a USB-connected optical drive or take the hard drive out and put it in another machine. And my favourite is to obviously use uh, network booting, uh, Pixie or PXE booting. Uh, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that, that, that's my current favourite. So what other kind of usage could we get out of a little box like this? The firewall thing sounds brilliant. But there machine are, in the machine. So we've got a firewall machine in the kitchen that's left on as uh, you know, browsing an IRC client. <laughs> Important things in life. Yeah. Well, I think one of the uh, useful things, if you just need a, a machine just for checking your email, web browsing, just general usage or even uh, editing, I don't think you'd get on so much with uh, artwork, but I think for uh, text document editing, uh, if you just had a monitor on your desk, you could actually attach it to the rear side of the monitor and so you could actually have a very tidy desk, but it just looks like you've got a monitor, keyboard and mouse. So I think I think that's a valid use for it, hmm. and also a play thing. You know, it's the it's a, it, similar to the the EPC. It's a low cost, uh, useful little bit of kit that, that you could you know you could find a use for. I think pretty much any geek out there is going to find some use for one of these things. I mean, it's a cheap PC. Yeah. yeah. How how much is it? Uh, it's if you go to their website, it's the Viglin's website. It's uh, ninety nine pounds plus VAT and postage. Yeah, see, that's a bit more than I'd be willing to pay. Well, that's good, because we've actually got to deal with them. Uh, if you want to get it cheaper, you can do. You can get it for £79, including VAT and postage. And you need to email them, mpc at viglin.co.uk. And if you email them and tell them that the U- Ubuntu UK podcast sent you, you can get it for £79. And see, that, that, that's a bit more like it. I think I might actually get a couple myself. Yeah, I'd be tempted. Now I, now I know about that price, I'm going to build a house out of them. <laughs> the 
Pug Radio Live was last weekend. We all had a great time. And the good news is, it's going to happen again next year. That's good news for the UK floss community. It's been announced that Launchpad is going to be open sourced within 12 months. Wait. Oh, good. Can we have jam tomorrow as well? <laughs> Bunch two weekly news have had their 100th issue. Yep, congratulations, and they've released a podcast to celebrate. Is it considered palindrome if you're talking about news in a news segment? Not palindrome. It doesn't work. Palindrome, palindrome of Bolton, Bolton, Bolton would be not lob. <laughs> <laughs> not lob. <laughs> yeah, okay. Potential fail there. Somebody's backported Flash Player 10 to Hardy in the, in the Hardy backports and yeah. managed to crash Firefox endlessly with it. Firefox crash? No. Nah. Ha. We've got Simon, Alan and Davy here. And we're also joined by Andy and Etienne. Now, they're here to talk about the OpenStreetMaps, which is something some of us have probably heard of. But can you tell us a bit about that? Okay, so OpenStreetMap is a, a wiki-like um, free map of the world that anybody can contribute to and anybody can receive the data from, make their own maps, view maps that we create from that data freely, use it just about for any purpose they like. Now, I mean, some people might say that Google Maps is free. Uh, how does yours differ from that? Well, Google Maps is only free if you want to have a look at it on their website. If you then want to go and uh, use that map for something else, then there's a license restriction on doing that. You can't just, you can print it off for your own use, take it in the car, get from A to B, but you can't go and download that information and then publicly process it or publicly publish it elsewhere. You can't put it on your own website. You can link to their site for, for an embedded uh, map, but you can't actually use that data in any way. You also can't change the look of it. You can't um, adjust it. And it has, for instance, it has no footpaths on it. It has no park, car parks on it. So it's actually actually quite limited in what, what it shows. It doesn't show everything that uh, potentially you might want to see on a map. Yeah, it's quite out of date as well, isn't it? Around my, uh, my house, it's been developed quite a lot, and there's a lot of roads and footpaths and all sorts of things that are not actually on Google Maps. Um, and am I right in thinking that I can actually change um, your data and add my data to it, so therefore we've got a more up-to-date map? Is that correct? Absolutely. You can um, uh, put uh, your own contributions on, so if you see something that's missing or wrong, then you can add it, and it will appear on the maps um, within a couple of hours, um, so you get very quick response time on that. And in many cases, you said about Google being uh, out of date. Um, the, the quality of Google data varies an awful lot, so in some places it's very good. But um, a, a very good example of how they, they were a little bit slow off the mark was Heathrow Terminal 5, um, which on the day that Heathrow uh, the Terminal 5 opened, um, Google was showing it as a sewerage works. We were showing it as a, an airport terminal. That's good news. And, uh, and in fact, the same applies to most of the other map providers. They were still behind, behind the curve on Terminal 5. I, I have actually contributed a, a fix to, uh, to Google Maps. There's a road near me that's a, a one-way, uh, it shows on a one-way street, and it's not. And so not only Google Maps, but my GPS takes me to the wrong place because they all get it from the same place. I, mean, I went to a website and filled in a form and said what was wrong. How much, how, much, how, how much work would it be for me to correct something on OpenStreetMap, for example? Well, the, if you want to just create one, or correct one item, say you want to correct your one-way street, then you, the easiest way to do that is effectively to uh, uh, go onto a website, which is not directly OpenStreetMap at the moment, uh, but likely will be included very soon, which is a contributor who's set up a, a site where you can log it, if you like, as a bug, and you flag it and you can say, this should actually be a one-way street, or this road name is actually spelt wrong, or you can put in what the road name is if it hasn't got a name. So that in a nice simple environment where just clicking on, on, a, on a map already and a little box opens and you can add that and that's placed on the map as a little marker. 
And then anybody coming along later who's a, an editor who knows the process of how to contribute properly to OpenStreetMap can then act on that and correct the bug, change it, adjust it, and what have you. Going beyond that, if you actually get interested in contributing to OpenStreetMap, then you can do it yourself. You can go straight in onto the editing part of the interface of the website, and you can immediately change that data just by clicking on the item in the editor and changing, if it's one way, putting a one-way tag on it. Do, are you actually dependent upon multiple people confirming that, or any single one person can make a change to the maps? Because it's a wiki style, uh, we have the history of every single object in the database. So anybody that edits it or makes a change on it, that's recorded. And you can get that information through, through the API, through the pro programming interface. Um, so anybody that uh, makes a change, say they change Regent Street to Oxford Street, for instance, then that would get picked up pretty much straight away. There are people who are looking at London all the time. It would be noted almost instantly. And therefore, someone will revert that change or they'll just re re retype in the correct name. So things like that. Um, there, isn't, there isn't a moderation process that requires uh, any data that's submitted to be checked before it becomes live. It's live straight away. But the reality is that when errors are found or when things are messed up, those are corrected pretty quickly. If I want to start contributing, how do I actually add to your database? Do I just get out um, uh, you know, a tablet and, and start copying a map I previously had or have? Um, how do I actually you know, add to your database? Well, the, the easiest way to start is to uh, either live somewhere where there is Yahoo aerial imagery, which we have an agreement with Yahoo that allows us to trace over the top of their uh, aerial imagery. But that doesn't cover the whole of the UK, for instance. It, uh, or, or, or it covers certain cities of the world, certain other areas that had a particular importance or interest, and, and Yahoo have ended up with that aerial imagery. So we're, we're allowed to uh, derive from that uh, and trace over the top, put the roads in. But, that, but you, you're not allowed to trace over like the maps. It has to be a no, photo, not a map a, that you're tracing. That's a big no-no with OpenStreetMap, is that you, we don't want people copying from existing maps. The whole idea of the project is to create maps that aren't tainted by somebody else's copyright. And then, because they're uh, derived from non-copyright sources, then we have control to be able to make sure that they stay free and open and usable by everybody uh, for the indefinite future. So one way is to, to trace over the top of aerial imagery that is available to us. If you don't have a GPS unit, which is our next way of doing it, well, that is the easiest way to get involved in the first instance in the project. If you don't live somewhere where there's Yahoo aerial imagery, then you really need to get out with a GPS unit. Um, we're talking about something similar to a sat-nav that you'd have in a car. Most sat-navs don't log a trace of where you've been. Some do. For instance, some of the TomToms, you can add an extra piece of software on them to do so. But if they don't, then uh, you need to get hold of a GPS that does, because what we're after is what we call the track log, or the trace from the GPS. Uh, as you're moving down the street, walking, cycling, whatever you're doing, you're collecting that trace of where you've been, you can upload that to the OpenStreetMap servers, and you can then trace your route over the top of that. So you're tracing a road, footpath, cycle route, train line, waterway, whatever you happen to have been traveling on at the time. And that is, the, that is primarily the, the way that the project started, and that is the largest contribution amount in terms of full amount of data goes in via GPS. So you trace in over the top, put in the roads and what you put in, and then you tag those up. You add extra information that tells everybody what that is. So if it's a primary road and it's reference uh, the road number, or if it's a, if it's a footpath, or if it's a, if it's a cycleway, so those are extra tags. And we can add as many tags as we want to any object in the database. And it is an unstructured tagging system. In other words, there's no rules that says you have to put this tag or that tag on. You put what you like on. So if your interest happens to be something specific, you can add tags related to that. There are people who have uh, uh, got an interest in things like uh, skiing that have uh, used this system to uh, draw ski maps and pieces and lifts and things like that. And then maps are then generated from that data. Uh, there's another group that are very interested in cycling and are doing all the um, Sustrans National Cycle Network. 
uh, and there's a map that shows that. So people with specific interests can um, add the tags that they're interested in to the, to the map data and then generate um, nice maps from that that are specific to, to their interest. So if I didn't actually go out to make a concerted effort to actually do mapping, if I just left my GPS logging, if I know I was going to be in the car all day and I know I'm going to be on roads, um, I could just submit a whole chunk of data and that would still be useful to you? Yes, absolutely, very useful to us. Um, what would happen if I happened to go into a shop car park or I went to a petrol station? Would, would that invalidate the data? Uh, no, that doesn't matter because there's always going to be some statistical anomalies and so on. And um, when we aggregate all the data together from lots of different tracks, then that all gets cancelled out. And in fact, it can be quite useful because if you if you know that most of these journeys are being done by car, uh, for instance, and there's a big lot of traces leading to a certain location, you know that that's somewhere where you either take a car to park or to fill up with fuel or something similar to that. So it's an indicator that actually there is something that's of relevance in terms of navigation or a map, and therefore you might want to investigate it if there is nothing on the map at the time. Yeah, I mean, most sat-navs nowadays have got a button that says, show me the nearest petrol station, and if you've got them marked on the open street map, then that's an advantage you have as well, isn't it? Yeah, we, we have all, I mean, not, not for the whole uh, world yet, of course, in terms of coverage, but it's growing rapidly. And, and, you know, we may be in the situation where every single petrol station in the UK is on the map by the end of 2009. Uh, it's, it's a realistic proposition. So it's not far away. Um, but we're not talking just um, uh, fuel stations. I mean, everything from supermarkets to letterboxes. I mean, there is no letterbox map. Do you know where your nearest letterbox is? I mean, no. you, might, you, you might do if, uh, you know, because you post in it by walking down the street. But if you happen to be somewhere else and needed a, to post a letter... Uh, well, I'm, well I'm, in, I'm in Wolves now, and I, I have no idea where the nearest post box is right now. So, yeah, absolutely. So, so we, we collect. I mean, they're easy to things to see and, uh, and notify, and, and we put those in, into OpenStreetMap. And a uh, very handy thing to have. Should we hand this over to you, because we've got to go... Can I just ask one more thing? Um, where did you actually get the traces for the actual um, land mass of each country? Uh, the, there is a, um, a, uh, a data set, especially in the US has a lot of data sets that are made publicly available because the, of government policy to make their data publicly available, um, which means a lot of things that are done by NASA and, and the like uh, are available. So there is a, a, a product called VMAP Nought, which is uh, basically basic coastline which gives the, the the outlines of the of the land mass uh, on top of that um, we've got uh, another source called pgs which is a coastline data source also out of the united states which is much more accurate and we've imported that um, into OpenStreetMap, and then we have people who um, uh, spend all their time correcting it against landsat aerial imagery which we can also use uh, satellite imagery which isn't very good resolution but it's certainly good enough to get a coastline and adjusting it to the shapes of islands and, uh, and, and areas. And we're talking about a huge amount of time that that takes. We even have tools, uh, we have a tool called Lake Walker, which can actually correct automatically going between the color of effectively blue water and browny green or whatever landmass. So it can actually follow the pixels on, on, uh, uh, on, 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 the, on, the, on the map and actually correct it that way. What's the, um, what's the scope of, of the project? Is this just sort of a UK-based thing? or, or? It's a worldwide project. It's, um, uh, the objective is to create a map of the whole planet. And there's activity. There's a lot of activity in Europe. Germany in particular is very active. Spain is pretty busy. The Netherlands, um, UK, Ireland. But also there's big active groups in Australia, in the US, um, in the Philippines, uh, South Africa, and India. Uh, and it's growing all the time, so um, it's very quickly going to have coverage for the whole planet. Okay, so uh, if I find an area which isn't actually currently mapped, I grab my GPS, jump in the car, and what, what do I do from there? You, you don't have to jump in the car, you could just go for a walk, or you could go on your bicycle, which is the way a lot of people prefer to do it. Uh, or you could take a bus ride, or you could go in a car, it really doesn't matter, or a horse, or whatever whatever you like, whatever your preferred mode of transport is. Um, so from your GPS unit at the end of the journey, you'll have some track logs, um, which you'll then uh, be able to upload to the website, that's openstreetmap.org. Those will then appear on, on the website as a series of dots um, that show the path that you took. 
you can then, using an editor on the, on the website, mark those paths as either a road or a footpath or a cycleway or whatever it was that you went along. And you do that using the tagging mechanism. Uh, so you'll mark it as uh, highway equals um, motorway or uh, whatever it is that um, you saw. I mean, one thing that makes me kind of nervous about actually submitting a, a, a GPS trace to you is what happens if I don't quite go to the end of the street or I, or I make a slight mistake? I mean, it's only partially correct data then because I haven't got the whole street map. I mean, is that still useful to you? Uh, yes, it is. It, it doesn't matter if you don't have complete data or if, the, if there's some uh, inaccuracies in the data because what we do is we consolidate over a period of time lots and lots of different track logs. So we get an average of all the different routes uh, and most of the motorways in the UK, for example, we've got hundreds of track logs, and so you can get a very nice average and see the exact centre line of the um, of the motorway from that. And so, does that mean it's it's worthwhile, or it's not worthwhile doing roads that are already in your map? If or is it still worthwhile going over it, over it again? Yeah, ab- absolutely. The more tracks we can get the better so even if you don't intend to do anything more than just record the track logs and upload them that's still useful because that adds to our database of, of raw data so the, the, the other thing that is important is that we're, we're looking for verification so when people question about you know is the road really there the more traces you've got going down that particular road the more verification you've got of it so you can quote it as a source effectively as you know we know that there's a road there we know that lots of people travel it if it's a real thick band of traces we probably even know that it's perhaps a motorway rather than a, a little residential road as a result one of the one of the things you say it's wiki style but one of the things that um, one of the more popular wikis um wikipedia suffers from is uh, abuse you know you get people on tv saying hey everybody go to this person's page and yeah screw it up is there a conceivable a possibility that you know a group of people could submit erroneous logs or uh, erroneous traces and end up you know putting roads that don't exist or you know well they couldn't i guess they couldn't delete roads that already exist but you know putting tracks and roads that, that just don't exist and, and you know causing problems for the users well, it's very easy to add extra stuff that, is, that doesn't exist, and we have had an instance recently uh, where that happened. Um, but because people are watching, they spot it, and it's removed quite quickly. So in some ways, yes, it's a similar problem to Wikipedia, but there is a big difference, and that is Wikipedia is not entirely based on facts. In other words, uh, well, the difference being that in, in, um, uh, in our case, we are representing what's on the ground, it's a physical object or the physical landscape. It, it doesn't lie. If you've got a, a picture of it or someone knows that it's there, it's correct. So it's relatively easy to check and verify by anybody whether it's true or not. Unlike Wikipedia, where you're looking at something and you're not sure what the validity of the item is. So, so you're yes, there, there, there is always going to be a risk and there will always be things, errors in the map. But then when we look at other maps and compare what we've done and what they are, we find just as many, if not more, errors in an area that's been mapped out in those alternatives. And that includes the commercial mapping um, uh, companies. And a very good example of that is if anybody buys a sat nav and has used one, most of you will have found that it takes you down a wrong road now and again. It routes you a wrong place or an area, that, a road that doesn't exist or you can't go down. So the areas exist in other maps too, it's, and it would not just be ours. Uh, you're taking this data right now. You mentioned um, the use of SatNav. You're taking this data right now, and it's essentially for producing your own maps. Right now, you're talking about producing paper maps, good old-fashioned navigation using, using paper rather than a GPS. Are you looking to put the data that you have onto GPS as a base map, um, even into sat-navs as well? Well, the, the main issue about sat-navs specifically is that quite often the, the map data that's used is linked into that device, and you can't add anything else. You can't change it. You can't select your map that you want to put on it. Now, that is slowly over time changing, and there is becoming, with certain products now, especially at the top of the end of the range, uh, you can have a better selection of what map you put on, and, or at least you can get into the system that allows you to put something else on. So that's specifically, though, with satellite navigation things that you'd have in a car as a, as a, as a cheap item that you buy as a standalone. Uh, if we move out of that field, though, and we look at things like recreational handheld devices, GPS devices, 
um, companies like Garmin. We can put OpenStreetMap mapping, in fact this little unit that I have in my hand now, um, that is displaying OpenStreetMap mapping on it now. Um, and uh, it, you know, we, we can do that right, right today and there's no cost of doing that. We can download the map from the website, put it on the Garmin unit and off we go. And it will also show, of course, therefore, what roads aren't there, so we can add the maps as we're going around very easily. Um, additionally, um, and this is really where there's going to be a lot of change in the next year or two, we're going to see a complete change in the market, is that most mobile phones will be GPSA enabled by the end of this year, if not sooner. And as a result, we're going to see all of them with a map on them and we have that capability now. Yeah, this phone that I'm holding in my hand, um, uh, this um, uh, has a GPS unit in it, and there's an application that somebody's written for this that enables you to view OpenStreetMap maps on this, um, on this phone. Interestingly, um, this application, in theory, can also display Google Maps, but Google sent the authors of the software a cease and desist letter, which actually shows some of the limitations in Google Maps um, you can use OpenStreetMap on your mobile phone, but you can't use Google Maps on your mobile phone. Um, do you actually have uh, a list of software that actually supports OpenStreetMaps? Um, yes, there, there are lots and lots of applications that people have written that use OpenStreetMap data. Um, the best place to find out about these is to look at the, the, the wiki on OpenStreetMap, um, which is a Wikipedia-like space on our, our website, where anybody that's written a, a solution or a tool that works with OpenStreetMap um, will have put some information on there. So that's the best place to start looking. Um, or just search Google for OpenStreetMap and you'll find lots of hits for things that you're interested in. Okay, so if I go to the site and, um, and have a look uh, at the maps, what am I going to expect to see? Um, if, if you go to openstreetmap.org, what you'll find is a, uh, a map viewer that will open up. And on the right-hand side of that map viewer, there's a little plus sign, which will allow you to select which layer you would like to look at. And we have, by default, three. We show three default layers of our map, which is actually the same data, but displayed slightly differently. Uh, the first one is called Mapnik, and that's our default, uh, and it's a, a general view of the world um, in, in a format that looks not dissimilar from, from what you'd see on Google Maps. Uh, the second is called Osmorenda, and that's um, much more up to date in terms of timing. The Mapnik layer is updated once each week, whereas the Osmorenda layer will quite often only be a few hours out uh, in terms of real data. Uh, and uh, that will show it slightly differently because it's uh, a slightly more customizable style that's being created for that and it's very much driven by the user base uh, by anybody that can change those styles to some degree. The last one is uh, called the cycle map and that is uh, a specific rendering of the national cycle network principally and other cycle routes as well that's been done by one of the contributors um, and that is uh, available that, that blends out, it, it greys out what you would normally see on the like of a traditional online map and then shows the national cycle network in, in bright colour and numbers so you can really easily see where the routes are. Okay, so you sound like you've got a massive community. Tell me about the community. What does the community get up to? You're not just a bunch of individuals. There must be gatherings. Um, we're pretty close to 50,000 registered users in OpenStreetMap um, and um, we have uh, at least 1,000 contributors per day uh, adding data to, to the map. Um, there are lots of occasions for people to get together in part of the OpenStreetMap community. Online there are wikis, there's forums, there's uh, chat rooms, there's all those ways of uh, communicating, mailing lists. Um, uh, so there's lots of opportunities and ways to, to communicate um, online. There's also something called mapping parties, which are organised weekends where um, somebody will designate a town that isn't yet mapped and um, invite people to come along uh, and just turn up for the weekend or for just one day over the weekend or how much time you have uh, and just help to map that town and that's a very effective way of getting a particular specific area mapped and it's an opportunity for contributors to meet each other, compare notes, have a good time and have a couple of beers. Is that a, uh, is that a good time for somebody new to it to actually sort of get a, a good introduction to, um, to the whole project? 
Uh, yes, it's an excellent opportunity for somebody new to come along and find out more about what, it, what it's about and, and learn how to do it. Yeah, it, it's also the importance that we want to stress always about this, that it is great fun. I mean, the project works because of the community. Um, it, it's an interesting community because it's not quite like perhaps communities that you find elsewhere where people come together with a, a direct common interest. This is a community of people from all walks of life, from the retired, excellent for retired people to get involved in because it's uh, great for fitness, all that sort of thing, because you can get out on walking and, and cycles, right through to uh, the very young who might take an interest in the, the very much the technical cutting edge side of things. So it's, it's open to everybody. It's also walks of life, as I said, in terms of that very few of us are anything to do with maps, any few of us are anything to do with computers. I'm a civil engineer, for instance, and therefore um, uh, I've come to the project because I have an interest in maps. I have an interest in computers. They're not my primary interests, but it's allowed me to um, take an extra interest and a, and a new hobby, if you like, that is very worthwhile and very rewarding. Where is OpenStreetMap going? What's your, your end goal? Well, the end goal, of course, is to have a complete map of the world. But when it, what, is com what does complete mean? Well, it's never-ending, because the reality is that as we fill out a place completely and get it mapped, OK, our contributor base that is really keen on mapping will move to another area and do the same there. But once a realistic area is completed, for instance, if we're talking about the United Kingdom, once our United Kingdom user base has finished the map, what are they then going to do? Are they all going to just go and find something else to do? Chances are not. The chances are they will start to look for new things to add to the data. So they'll be looking for things that, they, that are going to be of new use to people, so new interest to people. So if it's a, a pub or a, a supermarket or whatever, we might start to see some additional information being added to those facilities and those amenities. Uh, if it's a road, it might start to give some information about how much volume of traffic uses it, what its physical dimensions are. I mean, the, the, the opportunities are actually endless in this. So in terms of the, where it is going right now, we have 50,000 users right now. That's in four years. By the end of this year, the prediction on the current curve is 100,000 users. In other words, in the next less than six months, we will double our user base. In any given month, we have about 10 to 11 percent, and that is historically sustained, uh, of our user base contributing. So by the end of this year, we will have 10,000 plus users contributing each month. Another year beyond that, we'll probably be more than, a well, we may be up at a million in the world because th that's the way the, the, the shape of the graph is right now and we see no sign of it slowing down. Last week we had a competition, didn't we? Yep. And um, what was the question, Simon? I can't remember. It was, what is the fastest CPU that you can get in the shuttle Wraith, that we, the, which is what we're giving away? And that's what we reviewed in the last episode, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, reviewed in the previous episode, gave it away, started the competition in the last episode. We had over 100 right answers. We're going to pick one at random, and the winner is... Sasso Popovsky. Well done to you. Yeah, well done. <laughs> That's great. Well done. We'll email you and uh, get your postage details so we can get the wraith in the postie. Yep, good stuff. And we've got another competition this episode. What are we giving away? We're going to give away the Viglin that we just reviewed. Ah, the MPC. Indeed. Mm. And the question is? The question is, what would you use the Viglin MPC for? Doorstop is one suggestion. Yep. And any useful suggestions, uh, email them in and... This was sort of a competition where there's no wrong answer, really. We're just interested to see what your suggestions are, and we'll pick one of the entries at random, and you can uh, win the unit, and we'll ship it out to you. Good luck. So send your entry to competition at ubuntu-uk.org. And when's the closing date for this? 6th of August, so make sure your entries are with us by then. We had an interesting mail this week after the competition we set last time to win the Efficient PC. Um, we asked uh, for a bit of detail from the Efficient PC website, and uh, we had an email from Theodore Bullock, quite a comprehensive email, mm. uh, detailing the various CPUs and their nomenclature. Yeah, it gripped me. Yes. Uh, and uh, at the very end, he details that the name of the CPU given on the Efficient PC website is actually incorrect. And he gave the correct name and uh, indicated that anyone who gave the other incorrect name 
was in fact wrong and would not be winning the competition. Uh-huh. So if we followed that logic, he would be right. He would have won the competition and everyone else would have lost. Okay. Ah, hang on. But, but for one detail. Ah, what was the detail? He sent it to the wrong address. Don't fail. Um, Sorry, Theodore. And he also ends his email with, if I win your little contest thingy, I will give you my address at that time. Well, as you haven't won, we don't need your address. But thank you for entering. <laughs> <laughs> Meow. Or not. Oh, that's harsh. <laughs> that is pretty harsh. <laughs> we also had a nice email from Billy Toulis saying, bring back Laura, you b***. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. We'll get Laura back when she's good and ready. Yes. Thanks for the motivation. (laughs) Thomas Mashos, whose email we read out on the last show, has given us an additional comment saying that he's actually learned something from this show, which is really quite good news, um, and it's made him smarter. Uh, And that is that he always used to call FS Tab F Stab, and now he knows to call it FS Tab. What does he call Canonical, I wonder? (laughs) (laughs) for our listeners please see our our episode Episode two two. on on what pronunciation (laughs) on (laughs) right what's next we had one from liam mccombs and he just wanted to let us know it's a good podcast and it's one we really look forward to and it's always nice to hear things like that thank you yeah thanks liam we had a lot of feedback about our segment last time promoting Ubuntu and how to promote it without using free software as the as the motivator. We had so much yeah. feedback. I think we could probably get a segment out of that in a later episode. So if you've mailed in and we haven't read it out about that particular subject, don't worry, we'll, we'll probably bring it up. Um, and if you still want to uh, mail content about that, I think it would still be useful for definitely. our future episode. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We have more feedback about that one segment than I think we have had for any other single segment since we started, I think. Total, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and it was about three, I think, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As we mentioned in the previous episode, uh, we were making an effort towards transcribing. Um, how, how are we doing with that? Yeah, we've got uh, a bunch of people who are making corrections uh, and uh, contributing new content and carving up the episodes as well. It's, it's really good. We're getting a lot of good feedback for that. Excellent, excellent. And we've actually got um, the pages actually on the on the website as well now. So... Uh, you can actually view them, even though a lot of them aren't finished, you, you can actually view them by going to the main page and clicking transcripts. Okay, and if people want to get involved helping out, it sounds like we could still do with a few more helpers. How do they, how do, they do that? There's a team in Launchpad that can join. If you go to launchpad.net slash tilde transcribers and join the team, and uh, we'll drop your mail. And um, there's also a, a link on there to a wiki page that details exactly how you go about doing the transcribing. So you don't actually need to contact us. You can just get going with the the documentation that we've made out how to do it excellent good work and it is surprisingly easy it is actually you can just spend a little bit of time carving an episode up so you don't actually have to do any typing at all all you need is the ability to press like two or three buttons on the keyboard to stop and start the audio and press a button to carve it up it's really really easy we might even give a prize for the best transcription done a sticker (laughs) (laughs) i think we can stretch to two You can get us, as ever, on Twitter at twitter.com slash UUPC. And now on Identica, that's identity.ca slash UUPC. Because we love the freedom. Email us, podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. Yeah, we'd like to hear your suggestions for the show, any recorded material, tips, reviews, rants, photographs, abuse. Bring it on. And I'd also like to say thanks to our mirrors, uh, showmedo.com, bitvoke.com. And we've got three new ones. We've got Martin Meredith, Jonathan Davies and Ben. Thank you. You can also get us in our IRC channel, hash ubuntu-uk on the Freenode network. Give us a ring. The phone number's on the website. It's 0 something. 0845, isn't it? Let's not go there. (laughs) 08, expensive. Oh, here we go. (laughs) And we'd like to thank our interviewees from this episode, the folks from OpenStreetMap and Pete Steen. That's all for this episode. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye.